As we read Canto 32 of Paradise, we realize that we are nearing the completion of our journey. The second to last canto in the entire Divine Comedy feels like a prelude. It is the only canto that ends with an incomplete thought or sentence. In English translations, it ends with a colon, indicating in its very grammar the urgency of moving on to the final canto. As Dante himself taught, desire increases as it nears its goal. As readers, however, we ought to pause over some of the interesting features of Dante's story as it approaches its conclusion. Just as was true at the end of Purgatory, so too here in the final cantos of Paradise, one guide departs and another takes charge of Dante's education. In the previous book, Beatrice replaced Virgil. Now, St. Bernard replaces Beatrice. Bernard was a monk, prolific writer, church reformer, and mystic, known especially for his devotion to the Virgin Mary. As the canto begins, we find Bernard wrapped in divine contemplation, filled with delight. For the Christian, these moments of ecstatic union with God are not self-interested. They naturally overflow into acts of teaching and service. Thus, Bernard freely undertakes the task of teaching Dante. Bernard's example here calls to mind the motto of another medieval saint whom we have already encountered, St. Thomas Aquinas. He describes the goal of his ministry in these words, in Latin, contemplata aliis tradere, to hand on to others things contemplated. From the love of God, he writes, we are inflamed to behold his beauty, and the contemplation of such beauty overflows in teaching, preaching, and acts of charity. If Bernard is the model here at the summit of paradise, Dante's entire divine comedy can be understood in precisely these terms, as handing on to others what he has contemplated in the realms of Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. Bernard's task with Dante is to point out the souls dwelling in this portion of paradise and to prepare him for a direct vision of God. I'd like to focus on two puzzling features of this penultimate canto in the entire comedy. Given how much progress Dante has made and how close he now is to the direct vision of God, it's curious that he still has doubts and that he is still in need of intercessory prayer. The doubts arise from the vision that Bernard supplies to Dante of children in heaven who are redeemed without their conscious choice and who are also ranked according to levels of graced participation in the blessedness of heaven. Bernard reads Dante's puzzlement and comments, but now you doubt, and doubting do not speak. At the very threshold of the blessed vision of God, not only does Dante still have doubts, but he is also not chastised for having doubts, and the source of the doubt is a familiar one. Dante's bafflement over divine justice and mercy. If Bernard's response underscores the inscrutability of the divine will and the unpredictable generosity of divine grace, the fact that Bernard welcomes Dante's doubt also underscores the enduring importance of justice, whose concerns do not simply vanish in the presence of grace and mercy. The other puzzling aspect of the canto has to do with Dante's ongoing need for intercessory prayer, for mediation between himself and God. At the very end of the canto, Bernard admonishes him, but lest you now fall back when, even as you move your wings, you think that you advance, imploring grace through prayer, you must beseech grace from that one who has the power to help you. The one he must beseech at this point is the Virgin Mary. The final canto will begin with a prayer praising Mary and invoking her intercession, a prayer that lasts nearly 40 lines. Yet in the canto before he urges him to invoke Mary in prayer, Bernard counsels Dante, look now upon the face that is most like the face of Christ, for only through its brightness can you prepare your vision to see him? What Dante says of his encounter with the face of Mary is quite striking. Nothing, he writes, that I 
had seen before did transfix me with amazement so intense, nor show to me a semblance that was so akin to God. Given how many times and in how many ways Dante has been caught up in wonder, this is an astonishing statement. What are we to make of Mary's role here? We might begin by recalling the teaching of Plato's Republic in the Allegory of the Cave. Those freed from the darkness of the cave are incapable of immediately and directly facing the light of day. Their experience leaving the cave is like our experience leaving a dark theater in the middle of the day and emerging into bright sunlight. The eyes need to become accustomed to the light gradually and perhaps even through its reflections. So too, as Dante prepares to encounter infinite light, beholding Mary, the brightest of all human creatures, is a fitting preparation for encountering the infinite brightness of God. But it is not just Mary's brightness that is emphasized. Dante says that he had never seen a semblance that was so akin to God. If Christ is the image of the invisible God, Mary is the image most akin to Christ. Dante's theology and poetry are inexplicable without the notions of mediation, intercession, and image that permeate his poem from its beginning right up to its penultimate canto. In Dante's universe, God has decreed as part of providence that grace be mediated through the created order and especially through human cooperation with the divine will. But it would be wrong to think that Dante worships anything or anyone short of the divine. The great paradox of holiness is that the more worthy of our respect creatures are, the more their very beings point us, the more they urge us, the more they intervene on our behalf to move onward to behold the glory of the triune God. To that vision, we now turn. Thank you.